This is the season of holy waiting. <clears throat> We watch for the day when God's name will be made known among the nations. We wait in the shadows of the light of the world to appear. Come, let us walk in the light of God. Amen. During Advent, we recall God's promises spoken through the prophet. The word of the Lord is steadfast and true. To the hurting, God promises unshakable hope. To the forsaken, God promises unconditional love. The word of the Lord is steadfast and true. To the broken, God promises unmerited grace. The word of the Lord is steadfast and true. To the heavy hearted, God promises unbridled joy. The word of the Lord is steadfast and true. Today, we light two candles. The first candle reminds us to recapture the wonder of the season. In a world that seldom slows, Advent is an opportunity to still our hearts and open our eyes to the wonder and majesty of our Savior. So as we light the second candle, we call to mind God's promise to restore, redeem, and reconcile a broken world, spoken through the prophets and fulfilled through Christ. First reading, reading is from Exodus, the 20th chapter, found on page 75 in the Pew Bible. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth, beneath or in the waters below. You shall not, shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of, your Lord, of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who mis misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that they may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our second reading is from 1 John, the third chapter, found on page 1230 in the Pew Bible. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. 
We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's gospel is from Matthew, the fifth chapter, starting at the 21st verse. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Set her matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We're continuing our study in the Sermon on the Mount here in chapter 5. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we are grateful for this day, for life and breath as you give it to us. We are appreciative here of your words, even though they may be difficult for us to hear today. We pray that you would put aside any distraction or hindrance, that we might see you in these words, that you might teach us and speak to us. May then the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Carl Erickson, a 73-year-old South Dakota man, was sentenced to life in prison after admitting to the murder of a former high school classmate. Friends and family members were shocked that the once successful insurance salesman seemed to snap. Erickson had been married to his wife for over 44 years. But after the murder, Erickson's secret finally came out. For over 50 years, he had simmered with a belated grudge. He was still mad about a classmate who had once pulled a jockstrap over his head during a high school locker room prank. Norman Johnson, the classmate and murder victim, was a star athlete on the track team. Erickson was a student sports manager. According to Erickson's confession, on one occasion, Johnson put a jock strap on Erickson's head, humiliating him and planting the seed of resentment that would continue to grow for over half a century. Apparently, throughout their lives, Norman Johnson continued to outshine Erickson. Prior to his murder, Johnson had competed in co uh, college football, earned a degree, and then taught and coached at his alma mater for more than three decades. After holding the grudge for over 50 years, Carl Erickson rang Johnson's doorbell and shot him dead. Erickson told a judge, I guess it was from something that happened over 50 years ago. True story. Kind of shocking, right? Today, Jesus talks about murder. And I think more importantly, he talks about our anger towards one another. Pastor Corey introduced this later chapter 5 last week very well. Uh, by reminding us that Jesus enters now into a time of teaching in the sermon what it looks like practically to live in the kingdom of God. Pastor Corey told us that in chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
And by fulfill them, Jesus' teaching here is not merely another perspective or interpretation of the law, but more importantly, Jesus gives the true and ultimate meaning of the law. Jesus continues to set forth here for us today the norms and demands of living in the kingdom of heaven. This is what one looks like, Jesus might say, if they are living in the kingdom of God, if they have entered into the kingdom, if by faith and profession of faith and actions you're living in the kingdom, this is what you are, this is who you are and what you do. And, Jesus might rightly say, if one claims to live in the kingdom of God and doesn't look like this, well, then they might be found suspect when it comes to their proclamation. The youngest of the disciples, John, wrote, if we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Jesus has, through the next chapter, through uh, chapter 5, six antitheses that he's going to present. He gives a thesis, you have heard it was said, and he will quote directly from the Old Testament law or prophets, and then he gives his own interpretation, the interpretation, the ultimate and true meaning of that particular passage. Jesus here includes in each of these a direct quote of the law of prophets and then a uniquely, a declarative, authoritative declaration of the Messiah. That's his antithesis or antithesis. The antithesis does not so much oppose the law itself Sometimes we think, when Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, we think erroneously that Jesus is doing away with the law, that there's no reason to live it anymore. But no, what Jesus is coming up against, namely, are the Pharisees, who have an understanding and who have been teaching a shallow and inadequate interpretation of the law and prophets. And so, Jesus enters into this first antithesis, murder. I wonder why he chose this one first. It's interesting, isn't it? And yet, Jesus is going to speak pretty directly to this. He says, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. As Jim read for us, we heard the thesis in Exodus 20. And verse 13, this is the giving of the Ten Commandments to Moses, and then Moses gives these Ten Commandments to the people. The foundation of all the law and the prophets are found in these Ten Commandments. Murder. Thou shalt not murder. To murder means to take the life breath of another. To murder is the unlawful killing of one person by another person. It's not just God's law. It's common sense. Even those out in the natural world understand that murder is going way too far in our anger against another. But Jesus, in his interpretation, in his true and ultimate meaning of the law and prophets, redefines murder. Did you hear these words as I read them this morning? But I tell you, I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. What does that mean? It means they are guilty already. If there's anger in your heart towards another, you are guilty. Again, Jesus says, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Here, Jesus replaces murder with anger. Can you imagine the crowd <laughs> at this point? 
Pastor Corey and I were talking, and, and as he was praying, we, we were reminded this morning together that this would have been a very difficult word for the people to hear. The whole Sermon on the Mount would have been very difficult. I think instead of being encouraged by the Sermon on the Mount, people walked away from that sermon discouraged, frustrated, thinking to themselves, how in the world can I do this? We might be thinking the same today. How in the world can we keep from being angry at one another? Jesus moves beyond our physical actions and gets to the heart of the matter, our character. Raka here literally means empty and denotes contempt and hate against another. Someone would not say Raka towards a friend. Someone would only use Raka in the heat of the moment when they were most despised by the one to whom they speak this word. When we say Raka, we see anger in action. What we're telling the other person is, you have nothing for me. You mean nothing to me. Those are harsh words. Have you ever said to another, you mean nothing to me. You're empty. That's rough. That's, those are difficult teachings. The law, as Jesus reminds the people, governs their actions, but not their hearts. The law today only governs our actions and not our hearts. It's possible that I may not murder someone. I hope that's true. <laughs> it's possible that you may not murder someone. I hope that's true. But I could very well have a murderous heart, anger, and contempt for another. This is what Jesus is teaching here. You have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, do not have a murderous heart. Anger and contempt for another. One day, a lady in a brand new Volvo had been driving around a crowded parking lot and had finally found a spot and was just about to pull into it when a young man in a beat-up Kia whizzed into the spot before her. Ever happened to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, it has. <laughs> As the Kia driver got out of his car and was walking away, the lady in the Volvo called out, I found that spot first. What gives you right, the right to push in and take it? The young man laughed and said, because I'm young and quick, and kept on walking. All of a sudden, he heard the hideous sound of a car being heartily smashed. He turned around to see the lady in the Volvo repeatedly ramming her car into his. She caught his eye and said, that's because I'm old and rich. <laughs> okay. She had a murderous heart. She didn't murder him. But her heart was so full of anger. How many times have we wanted to be that person to ram the other's car? The law is not merely satisfied here if no blood is shed. Rather, it is fulfilled when anger is replaced with love. Let me say that again. Because the people's understanding was that this law was fulfilled when no blood was shed. And yet Jesus says, blood, no blood, it doesn't matter. Jesus says, this law is fulfilled when you take your anger for another person 
and replace it with love. Otherwise, you stand in contempt and judgment and found guilty. Again, the Apostle John wrote, For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Jesus gives this antithesis to the law of murder and says, let's go deeper. Let's go to the heart of the issue. Let's get to your character. Do you have murderous thoughts? Are you angry at another? And then he gives two examples of what this might look like. The first found in verses 23 and 24. Jesus says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Here it's pretty clear that you are at fault, meaning you are the one who has a murderous heart you are angry at another. And so you bring your offering before God. This is your heart. This is your life. This is yourself. But the more important thing here, Jesus says, is what? Reconciliation before worship. This is an astounding teaching. Why would Jesus say such a thing? That, that God prefers our reconciliation with one another before we offer our worship to him. D.A. Carson writes, For the latter becomes pretense and sham if the worshiper has behaved so poorly that his brother or sister has something against him. People love to substitute ceremony for integrity, purity, and love. But Jesus will have none, none of it. Ooh, are, are those words convicting? <laughs> Ooh, those words hurt. Remember the words of Jesus, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So if we come up to this altar today with sacrifice, with worship, with offering, with a gift for God, and our hearts are murderous, filled with anger for someone else. And I would suggest to you that especially if our anger is directed towards someone else in this church, in the body of Christ, well, we might just as well not come before we are reconciled, one with another. Jesus gives a second example, Matthew chapter 5, 25 and 26. Set her matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have been paid the last penny, until you have paid the last penny. Again, you are at fault. What's your fault? Anger. A murderous heart. You have contempt and hate for another. And Jesus says, pay what you owe before you are judged for it. What do you owe? You owe an apology, maybe. Maybe you owe a heart of repentance. Maybe you're seeking forgiveness. If you are to live in the kingdom of God and not be found suspect, you owe love, not hate. Respect, not disdain. I wonder if things would be different between Carl Erickson And Mr. Johnson, 
I wonder if Norman Johnson would still be living today if Carl Erickson had heeded the words of Jesus. If Carl would have replaced his murderous thoughts, his anger and his contempt with love. Friends, Jesus says to us, you have heard it was said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, but I remind you, but I expect of you, but I require of you, anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Let's reconcile. Let's put aside our murderous hearts for hearts of love. Amen. Please remain standing as together we profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Together, as a sign of unity with the Church throughout history and all believers today, we now pray as our Lord Jesus first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 